Hello, welcome. It is week three, so this is lecture three. And I'm going to look at life in the industrial U.S. Uh, there are a couple of things. Uh, there's life in the South, life in the cities, and then to this overall look at what's going on. There's something called the gospel of wealth and social Darwinism I'm going to tell you about today, too. Uh, before I do that, though, just a, a real quick note, if you didn't see it somewhere, online courses have been extended through March 1st. So if you are in a class that would normally meet in a classroom but got transitioned to online, uh, check with those instructors just to see if there's anything you need to change. Of course, for this class, it won't affect anything since we're online all semester. But if you are in one of those classes that was supposed to meet in a classroom, double check with your instructors to see what's changed since you will be online for an extra month. All right, let's get started here. Life in industrial America. And the first is business and economy. And there's this idea of social Darwinism. Uh, you find this a lot in anthropology. Um, it's a it's a very interesting thing. Um, it's named after Charles Darwin, but it has nothing to do with Charles Darwin's ideas. It's not evolution or anything like that. Uh, but social Darwinism, it's this idea, it's this very conservative idea, actually, where the best competitors win. The best competitors are the ones who will survive. Think of it like survival of the fittest. And there's also this idea that development should be slow and unhurried. It should be done without assistance. It should be done without government interaction. Um, competitors should win, and that winning should be a natural development. Now, there are two people who really come up with this idea. The first one is Herbert Spencer. Spencer was an Englishman. He lived in the 1850s. And he argued that the law of evolution could be used not just in a scientific way, but also in an economic way. And he's going to say that the poor are poor for a reason. The poor are unfit. And nature should eliminate the poor. Not only that, but the government shouldn't help the poor at all. He has a student named William Graham Sumner. And William Graham Sumner becomes a strong advocate for his mentor, Herbert Spencer, and this idea of social Darwinism. And William Graham Sumner is going to say that the progress of man, the progress of society requires unrestricted competition and requires the poor being eliminated from society. And from here, this idea of social Darwinism takes off and it is one of the main schools of thought in the late 1800s, especially if you're somebody who is well off in society. There is uses of social Darwinism to support racism. Reverend Josiah Strong in 1885, he writes a book called Our Country. And in this, he says, social Darwinism is a good thing as long as the white Anglo-Saxon is protected. And Josiah Strong used the idea of social Darwinism to put white Anglo-Saxons above immigrants, Catholics, Mormons, above saloons, pretty much everything other than white people. Even Teddy Roosevelt was in many ways a social Darwinist. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt believed that there was going to be a racial war in the American West that was going to be won by white Anglo-Saxons. Because those in power were believers in social Darwinism, in the late 1800s, government assistance to everyday Americans is very limited. For example, one of the things I talked about pre in a previous lecture was how businesses were run. Tariffs 
taxes on import goods were sky high to protect American industry. It didn't matter if people could not afford American goods. American goods are what you were going to be required to buy because the government didn't want to give you any help or assistance. Government subsidies, meaning government money, government grants, are going to be given to businesses like railroads. Now, you do have something called the Homestead Act. The Homestead Act, basically, if you're given 100 you're given 160 acres. You agree to live on it for five years. And if you improve it, then you get to keep it. Uh, Hetty Lee Anderson from the previous lecture, um, she had a version of the Homestead Act and was able to move to Nebraska. But, you know, it didn't really work out so well for her. Now, what a lot of people were doing who were well off is they were getting this land from the Homestead Act and they were improving it, but probably not in the way you think. Because it was never specified what an improvement was, some people were building houses so small they could not possibly be inhabited. Some people were just putting fences on empty lots. And the government said, you know what, that's good enough. You get to keep that land. You also have the Morrill Act. And the Morrill Act created colleges, which sounds like a good thing. And colleges sounds like they're going to, you know, help the poor. But in reality, the wealthy were using these colleges created by the Morrill Act as a way to dump all their money and not pay taxes. So the Morrill Act and the Homestead Act, even though it looks on the outside like it's meant for everyday people, those were two programs built for the wealthy. Now the legal system, it is not set up to help the employee at any point. It's all meant to help the employer. And I have a couple things here that were being used. Uh, the first one is the fellow servant rule. An employee could not sue the employer for an injury caused by the negligence of another employee. So if you get hurt on the job because of something another employee does, your employer not liable in any way, shape, or form. There's contributory negligence. If you are the least bit negligent and you get hurt, it's your fault. So let's say, for example, you work at Publix and you're working in the deli and you're sitting there slicing meat in the deli. You look up for one second to tell the customer, I'll be right there, and you slice your finger off in that meantime. It's your fault for looking away from the slicer and talking to a customer. The company has no guilt in the matter. Assumption of risk. If you knowingly do a dangerous job, then it's your fault if you get hurt. If you're a fireman and you get hurt, it's your fault. If you're a police officer and you get hurt, it's your fault. If you're a roofer and you fall off the roof, it's your fault. Then there's the idea of foreseeability. For an employer to be liable, they had to foresee the potential for injury. So all those freak accidents that happen, maybe you're driving across the bridge and the bridge falls down and you're working for UPS or something. If UPS didn't imagine that bridge was going to fall, then they're not liable. Employee contracts strictly enforced written to favor the employer over the employee. And then there's the idea of caveat emptor, buyer beware. No warranties, no guarantees of safety, no recalls, nothing like that. If you buy a death trap, you know you're buying a death trap. It's your own fault. None of that is set up to help the everyday person. That's all to protect businesses. It's all to protect wealthy people. But then we get an idea called the Gospel of Wealth, and this was an idea created by Andrew Carnegie. Uh, Andrew Carnegie, one of the richest men of all time, mentioned him in a previous lecture. In June of 1889, he wrote an article called the Gospel of Wealth. And in this article, he says it's the moral responsibility of the rich to give to those who are less fortunate. This is the beginning of the end of social Darwinism, in a way. 
Now, Carnegie is going to follow through with his own words. He's going to put his money where his mouth is. And he's going to give money to libraries. He's going to give money to museums. He's going to give money to concert halls. But he does not give money directly to the poor. Because Carnegie thought that only those who truly deserve to improve themselves would seek out improvement. He knew that not every lower income or less fortunate person was going to go to these libraries or these museums or concert halls, but only those who could overcome social Darwinism. Some other examples that could be considered gospel wealth, it, there's a guy named Reverend Russell Conwell, and he believed it was the Christian duty to become rich. And he would preach, actually. He was a Baptist businessman and a minister. And he actually would go and preach. He would say 98 out of 100 of the rich men of America are honest. That is why they are rich. Dishonest rich men were rare. Reverend Conwell would also say people were poor because God was punishing them. And he played into both the social Darwinism and the gospel of wealth by saying, don't give money directly to the poor. Give money to the churches who will then protect the poor. Now, in reality, Russell Conwell was padding his own pockets, but that's beside the point. Taking a step further, you have Reverend DeWitt Talmadge. He was a Presbyterian minister from Brooklyn. And he would say, if you are going to kill the church thus with bad smells, I will have nothing to do with this type of evangelization. In other words, DeWitt Talmadge did not want the poor in his church. He did not want working men in his church. His church was going to be for upper class people only. Now, there are some very important voices against this idea of the gospel wealth. There are some people out there very early on who think the poor and less fortunate need to be helped. For example, Henry George, in 1879, he writes a book called Progress and Poverty, and he proposes this redistribution of wealth. He believed that America was a land of plenty. And poverty should be eradicated. And he thought you should take from the rich and give to the poor. It's almost like an 1880s Robin Hood, if you will. He also believed in the flat task, tax or a single tax, as it was called in the day. So that people paid a flat fee or a flat share of their income. Mark Twain, or maybe a guy named John Beach. We're not really sure. 100% who wrote this article. But in the 1880s, there was an article called Poor Little Stephen Gerard. And in this article, Poor Little Stephen Gerard, the idea of rags to riches is argued against. In Mark Twain or John Beach, whichever one it was that wrote this, says rags to riches is a complete myth. Those who are poor need help. And they even say, you know what? Reverend Josiah Strong is completely wrong. There are rich who lie. There are rich who cheat. Edward Bellamy in 1888 writes a book called Looking Backward. And in Looking Backward, Bellamy's hero falls asleep in the year 1888, wakes up in the year 2000, and finds a, a country that has no war, no poverty. The government runs a central economy and everybody works for the greater good. Sounds a little bit like socialism, or at least as we see socialism today. And speaking of socialism, there's the originator of socialism and the originator of communism, Karl Marx. In Karl, in, uh, Karl Marx's world, workers of the world unite, the proletariat will overthrow the bourgeois. In 1867, he writes a sequel to the Communist Manifesto where he says 
the I whole idea behind capitalism is to exploit labor. So these are people who say, you know what, social Darwinism and the gospel of wealth maybe aren't the best way. The government does do a little bit, but not much. In 1890, the Sherman Antitrust Act is passed. It was sponsored by the brother of William T. Sherman, Senator John Sherman of Ohio. Now, the Antitrust Act probably doesn't do what you think. It doesn't break up every trust. It doesn't break up every monopoly. But what the Sherman Antitrust Act did was it prevented anti-competition agreements. It also forbid attempts to monopolize markets. So you can't purposely drive competitors out and you can't purposely make anti-competitive agreements. Now, in reality, the Sherman Antitrust Act didn't have a whole lot of bite to it. In fact, John D. Rockefeller gets rid of the Standard Oil Company and breaks it into smaller companies because he's able to avoid the Sherman Antitrust Act by saying, look, it's not one big company. There are multiple companies. I just happen to be the chairman of the board. In 1895, there is a U.S. Supreme Court case that challenges the Sherman Antitrust Act called the U.S. versus E.C. Knight Company. Now, the E.C. Knight Company was a sugar manufacturer from Louisiana that controlled more than 95% of all the sugar refining in the United States. It goes all the way to the Supreme Court case, or to the Supreme Court, when the government tries to build a case against it using the Sherman Antitrust Act. Well, when it gets to the Supreme Court, they look at the Sherman Antitrust Act and they look at the case before them and they decide sugar refining is a manufacturing issue. It's not an interstate commerce issue. Meaning, just because E.C. Knight Company manufactures most of the sugar in the United States, it doesn't mean that it has entered into an anti-competitive agreement with anybody. There's just nobody else who can compete with it. And because of that, the Sherman Antitrust Act did not apply. Well, moving on from there, what is life like for the everyday person? Well... There are a lot of changes going on. Uh, first of all, there's the growth of public transportation really for the first time and transportation in general. So you start to get these distinct districts. You get a residential district, you get an industrial district, and you get commercial districts. Residential, most people live there. Industrial, most stuff is made there. Commercial, most stuff is bought and sold there. Those are districts that for the most part still exist today. Mass transit, uh, you know, whether it's trains, horse-drawn trolleys, electric trolleys, um, subways, whatever it might be, mass transportation begins in the last part of the 1800s. And with the rise of transportation, the idea of urban sprawl begins. Cities start to expand. Middle and upper class people move out of the inner city and start moving to the outside of cities, leading to the beginning of suburbs. And wherever these middle and upper class people move, the businesses follow because the people with the money are no longer in the cities. Now, some people ask, why did these people move? It's because they want to get away from pollution. They want to get away from the noise of the city. They want to get away from the smells. They want to get away from the sights. And I hate to say it, they want to get away from the poor people too. Now cities are going to get more and more important in the late 1800s. There's a fancy term called entrepot, basically a point where large amounts of money, large amount of immigrants, large amount of trade happens. So as these cities gain importance, they become centers of communication. They become centers of trade. They become centers of commerce and they become centers of money. As the city populations grow, 
more factories are put in the cities because there is a ready-made labor force that is willing to work for cheap. You also have to look at migrants and immigrants. Migrants are internal immigrants. So if you move from one part of the country to another, you're considered a migrant. If you move from one country to another country, you're considered an immigrant. Now, cities in the late 1800s, they're going to expand through both the arrival of migrants and immigrants. You're going to have natural population growth on top of that. And then you're going to have physical growth of the cities as well. Let me start with migration. You have a lot of people moving from the rural agricultural areas into urban cities to take factory jobs. You also have your first wave of black migration where African-Americans move from the South to places in the North and the Midwest trying to escape the Ku Klux Klan and Jim Crow laws. But migration is just a small part of the growth of cities. Really, immigration is going to be the driving force. I've got some numbers here for you. Between 1865 and 1900, 13 and a half million immigrants come to the United States. That's a 45 year period. But the next 10 years, 1901 to 1910, more than 10 million people come to the United States in just that decade alone. Now, if we were in class in person, I'd show you a whole list and write up on the, on the uh, chalkboard a whole list of where people came from. But for the purposes of this online class, you don't really need to know any of that. But I do want you to know that if you are from an Irish family, a German family, an Eastern European family uh, originally, there's a very good chance your family came here somewhere between 1900 and 1920. Now, a lot of these first generation immigrants, uh, they stick to the old ways of life. They may not learn English if they originally know a different language. Uh, they're going to keep a lot of their same customs, their same religion, etc., etc. Uh, there's one real, one real um, outlier, if you will, one one exception. A lot of first generation men try to marry into an established American family. The second generation, the kids of the immigrants, they try to become fully American and there's a lot of conflict between these first generation immigrants and their children. Now, what were the living conditions in these cities? Well, there are housing problems all around. In the late 1800s, there really are not skyscrapers. Even in New York City, the largest buildings are only like five stories tall. So there's housing problems everywhere. You also have the idea of poverty. Um, remember, all the wealthy people have moved out of the city, so the inner cities are left primarily with people who are less fortunate. They have a harder time making ends meet. Uh, they can't afford nice places to live. There's, uh, you know, food assistance needs, etc., etc. With that comes a lot of crime, a lot of violence. Uh, the police force, not necessarily uh, professional yet. Basically, you had to pay night watchmen to come and protect your, your uh, property. And if you didn't pay the night watchmen, then uh, they're not going to protect you. But a big question is, why do people keep coming into the cities? And why do people keep coming to America? If there are so many housing problems, if there's so much poverty, if crime and violence is through the roof, well, it's because of the idea of mobility, this idea of movement and improving. Uh, first of all, there's occupational mobility. There's this idea that you can get in on the ground floor. You can be a hard worker and you can work your way up the corporate ladder until you become a manager or maybe a business owner or maybe 
rich. There's the idea of residential mobility. Sure, you may live in a slum, you may live in a one bedroom apartment with 12 other people, but if you work hard and if you save your money, you can achieve home ownership. And then there's the idea of ethnic mingling. Um, there's this idea that if you work hard enough and if you try to assimilate, that you'll be accepted by other ethnicities. In some cases that does work, but in others it doesn't. And ethnic mingling or ethnic mixing doesn't work as well as people hope, which is why in a lot of big cities even today you find places labeled Chinatown, Little Italy, or things like that. Political bosses are in charge of some of these big cities. What is a political boss? It's pretty much somebody who gets elected repeatedly by making promises. So if you have a person in New York City who wants to get elected, they make you a promise. I promise I'll give you this, I promise I'll get you that. And they give you just enough so that you want to keep voting for them. You want to keep electing them. Now, how do you keep this political boss honest? You don't vote for them. But if you do vote for them, there's no guarantee that they're going to do what they promised. Eventually, you start to get some reforms. You get housing reforms. You get housing inspections. You get minimum size requirements. You get maximum occupancy rates it used to be that people would rent bathrooms closets whatever they could you can't do that after a while um, sewer systems develop water systems develop clean water starts to be a thing uh, not only that but the police forces become public servants fire protection becomes a public service and you even get the birth and creation of beautification programs and city parks. So living conditions will improve some, but it's gonna take a lot of work and a lot of time. Now, what are the changes in everyday life? Um, one thing that happens, uh, you get this idea of cost of living increase. Uh, cost of living increase is gonna come because um, there are more options for you. There, the housing prices are gonna go up. Uh, there's gonna be more modern advances, if you will, the beginning of appliances, the beginning of um, you know, transportation, things like that. So the cost of living is gonna rise, but incomes are gonna rise too. The problem though is incomes can't keep up with the cost of living. So while people are making more money than they did in the past, the cost of living in the, in the late 1800s is going up even faster than incomes. And because of that, families are gonna take on second jobs, families are gonna take on boarders or renters, and many families are going to kick out members of their family who don't produce anything. So if you have an elderly aunt, an elderly uncle, grandparents, something like that, they may be displaced to take in renters. There's also higher life expectancies. Um, the child or infant mortality rate is starting to come down. Medical advances are allowing people to live longer. So life expectancies are going to go up. And that, of course, means cost of living will go up as well. Another change in life in the late 1880s, early 1900s is convenience. You get your first processed foods, you get your first preserved foods in tin cans, meaning that you could keep food for longer amounts of time. Your first refrigeration systems are developed in the late 1800s, which will keep cold food longer. Uh, clothing. Nobody buys their clothes in the 1850s, 1860s everybody made them but by the 1880s 1890s you're going to be going to the store and buying clothing much like we do today because it's quicker easier and cheaper 
And then when we get to the early 1900s, you get the idea of department stores and grocery stores. So Macy's that I talked about previously will stop being a mail order distribution and start opening brick and mortar stores. Sears will stop being a mail order catalog and start opening actual stores. Places like Piggly Wiggly and Publix and A&P, which doesn't really exist anymore, will open up grocery stores. So instead of having to go to all these different markets to get your things, you can go to one store. So there's convenience. And over time, birth rates are actually going to go down as well. Why? Because it costs so much to have a big family. So you end up with smaller families to cope with the cost of living increase. Popular entertainment. Uh, we've got a lot more leisure time because of the rise of factories and the rise of mechanization. Uh, because people aren't working and creating everything by hand because there are some machines that are now doing the work, you have more leisure time. Now what were these people doing in their leisure time? A lot of the same things we do today. Baseball, cycling, running, football. Uh, circuses used to be popular. Uh, once upon a time, there used to be a thing called a theater. Um, people go to the theater and they would have drama. Uh, they would have comedy acts. They would do vaudeville, singing, dancing. And you have the birth of movies. Now, I know theater and movies, that's a, that's a strange thing to think about in 2021. But maybe, hopefully, in a couple of months, movies and theaters will come back. There's nationwide advertising. Uh, you could live in the middle of nowhere, Wyoming, and you could see the same ad as somebody in downtown New York City. And you being in the middle of nowhere, Wyoming, you can order something and have it shipped to you on the railroad. So there's this nationwide demand for products for the first time. There's also popular literature of the day. Uh, once again, you can live anywhere in the country and you can read the same books. Uh, you can listen to the same radio plays eventually. And in reality, this popular entertainment, everybody doing the same things kind of brings our country a little bit closer together. The South is a little bit different story, though, because the South is going to stay so agricultural and so rural. After the Civil War, the Southern economy, it's in really bad shape. It has to be rebuilt from the ground up. Um, everything in the South is destroyed. There's no roads, there's no railroads, factories, mills, you name it. There's nothing. There is a shortage of money. There's a shortage of banks. There's no education system. So after Reconstruction, starting in the 1870s, the economy of the South is rebuilt, most of it with money from Northern businessmen. Uh, you get the idea of sharecropping. Uh, in sharecropping, you have the landowner who rents out part of their land to families who then have to pay off their debt to that landowner. If there's any money left over at the end of the year, they get to keep it themselves. But in reality, there's usually not much money left. Extractive economies, that's where items are taken from the ground. Uh, even today in Georgia, there are a lot of mining operations. There are a lot of, of um, logging operation, operations in Georgia. Extractive economies were found all over the South. And then you have textile mills. If you're from you know, Villarica, Bremen, Noonan, LaGrange, Carrollton, you should be somewhat familiar with textile mills. These are all cities that used to run completely on the manufacturing of clothes. Um, if you're Carrollton, there's the Mandeville Mills and the Mansion. If you're from LaGrange, there's the Calloway family. If you're from Bremen and Bowden, there's the Sewell family. All those big textile mills used to run the South after the Civil War. South also saw Jim Crow. This is the next evolution of those black codes that I mentioned previously. Remember black codes and Jim Crow, not the same thing. Black codes were immediately after the Civil War. Jim Crow is gonna be something that develops kind of in the 1870s, 1880s. 
Um, Jim Crow, the easiest way to see Jim Crow laws is in poll taxes and literacy ta tests. Uh, in order to vote in the 1880s in the South, uh, you had to be able to pay a tax. A lot of poor whites and a lot of poor blacks could not pay that tax. Literacy tests were designed to be impossible to pass. Uh, you can go on Google right now, you can try to look at a literacy test from the 1880s and they are extremely difficult even for us today. Poor whites and most African Americans could not pass a literacy test. But there was a part of Jim Crow laws called the Grandfather Clause. And the Grandfather Clause said if your grandfather could vote, you could vote too. Why is this significant? Poor Southern whites, their grandfathers could vote. Southern blacks, their grandfathers could not vote because they were not considered citizens of the United States. Now, Jim Crow laws are going to last in some way, shape, and form from the 1870s, 1880s, all the way up until the 1950s and 1960s. You also have school segregation. Now, surprisingly, the earliest school segregation is actually found in Massachusetts, where a guy named Lemuel Shaw asked for separate but equal facilities. Pennsylvania passes the first law for segregation of railroads. Neither one of those laws are challenged in court. And when the southern states see that they can get away with segregation, it spreads like wildfire. So by the end of the 1880s, every southern state had segregation laws in place, and those segregation laws will stay until the 1860s. There are even differing views on racial relations within white communities. There's what we call the liberal view, the radical view, and the conservative view. In the liberal view of race relations, uh, it was believed that the abilities of African Americans had never actually been explored, and therefore people didn't really know what the African American communities were capable of accomplishing. And most who had the liberal view, they wanted blacks and whites to live together. They wanted African Americans to assimilate into mainstream American culture. And it was believed the way to do that was through education. In the radical view, uh, it was insisted that African Americans had no place in American society and that emancipation was the worst thing that ever happened for African Americans. It sent black people on this downward spiral of destruction and it would end with a savage beast. Now these people also believe that slavery was the only thing that kept African Americans civilized. So you can kind of see what they, what side of the Civil War they may have been on. In the end, the conservative view is the one that wins out. And the conservative view is the one that's going to be in place up through the 1940s. It was this idea that you should control the lives of African Americans through segregationist laws. Think of it almost like old school Southern feudalism, where African Americans were the peasants and white Southerners were the lords and the ladies. The other thing you gotta talk about when you talk about the South in the late 1800s, early 1900s, is the rise of the second KKK. The first KKK uh, was a product of reconstruction the first KKK is going to die out in the 1870s. But when we get to November of 1915, the second KKK is born when a gigantic cross is hauled up to the top of Stone Mountain and burned and could be seen from downtown Atlanta. Now, what brought on the second KKK? Well, it's a movie called The Birth of a Nation by D.W. Griffith. And you can actually go on YouTube. The entire movie is on there if you care to watch it. But uh, in Birth of a Nation, it glorified white society. It glorified the idea of 
the original Klan and keeping African Americans down. And it was based on a movie originally, or not a movie, but it was based originally on a book called The Klansman. Now, The Birth of a Nation in 1915 was the biggest movie that the country had ever seen. And out of the movie, the, the idea of the second KKK is born. And the second KKK is the one that you often think of with white hoods, white robes, cross burnings everywhere. And the KKK was opposed to Jewish people, black people, Catholic people, immigrants from Southern Europe, immigrants from Eastern Europe, basically anybody who wasn't a white Anglo-Saxon whose family had been here for years. Now, the scariest thing about the second KKK is at its largest, it had a membership of over 5 million people. Something like 20% of all Americans could claim some sort of tie to the KKK in the 1920s. Now, last but not least, um, from the African American point of view, there were two big leaders. They're not the only leaders, but they were the two biggest names of the day. There's Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois. Booker T. Washington lives from 1856 to 1915. Uh, he believed in a slow, gradual coming together of black and white culture. He believed in gradual equality, and he thought this should be done through education, specifically technical education. And Booker T. Washington is very famously uh, going to go on and found the Tuskegee Institute down in, in Alabama, just a little bit of past where Auburn is. W.E.B. Du Bois, he's going to live from 1868 to 1963. He takes a slightly different view. He believed in immediate equality. And he believed that African Americans should actively fight for economic equality, educational equality, and political equality. And W.E.B. Du Bois, along with some others, is going to go on to found the NAACP in the late 19, in 1909 is when it is, early 19 teens. And the job of the NAACP at the time was to demand full equality and the immediate end of racial discrimination. All right, I know this was a little bit longer than the other two videos, uh, but it was a lot of material to get through. Uh, for this week, I'll show you this real quick. There is only one article. It's called Races in the United States. And I have it saved as a text file. It was originally a newspaper article. And what I want you to look for in this is, number one, how is race portrayed? Um, it's not going to be our way of looking at race. It's not based on skin color. So I want you to look at how race was portrayed and what the author of this newspaper article thought of race. And then I want you to consider how has race changed since 1908 and now. Uh, this is a very interesting article. Uh, I have, usually when we do in-class discussions, there are more comments on this article than I think any other that I really have the, the class read. Uh, the other thing I want you to pay attention to, let me pull over one more thing here, is our course schedule. We're on week three. So you have your discussion that's going to be on that races article. You're going to have your quiz, but you're also going to have your first reflection paper. What is a reflection paper? Any of the readings that we've done already, whether it's the Pullman strike, the cross of gold speech, uh, Hetty Lee Anderson's diary, Black Elk speaks, the races in the U.S. that we're doing this week, or the scrubby letter coming to America, I want you to pick one of those different articles. I want you to do a personal reflection on it. 
what did you think of Hetty Lee Anderson and her Homestead Diary? What did you think of reading about Black Elk Speaks? Uh, what were your opinions on the, the railroad strikes? What are your thoughts on races in the United States? Now, to do well on the reflection paper, it's got to be about a page and a half. Double space it, but one page and then an additional half. For your first paragraph and your first paragraph only, just give me a quick summary of the article so I know which article you're doing. Hetty Lee Anderson was a homesteader in the 1880s. She moved her family from Illinois to Missouri, eventually in Nebraska. Her family didn't do so well, and eventually they have to give up the farm. Whatever it might be for that first paragraph. The rest of it, give me your personal thoughts. Take some time and think about the situation. Um, I can't believe how different races were in 1908 compared to today, but I see some similarities in how the races were, were treated, or race in 1908 has nothing to do with race today in 2021. Uh, that's one example, don't use that exact one. Or maybe you feel strongly about William Scrubby. I could never possibly get on a ship and go three months, not know where I'm going. He's got a lot of courage, or I can't believe how dumb William Scrubby was to leave a good life and move to Wisconsin. I mean, who goes to Wisconsin in the first place? Spoiler alert, I grew up there. Uh, whatever your opinion might be, that's what I want you to do for a reflection paper. And I enjoy reading reflection papers. It's your chance to really give your thoughts on something you've read. It's really your chance to give an opinion on what you think. So uh, if you have any questions on how to do that, email me and I'll do my best to answer. But um, I think 48 minutes is plenty of time for one video. I hope you sit through and listen to the whole thing. And uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. We'll see you soon.